June 2019, Hong Kong's Central Business District. Protesters outside a tall glass government building are chanting and shouting slogans like Hong Kong, never give up, and wave the evil law. They're a million strong, and they are angry. They're wielding umbrellas, a symbol of the pro-democracy movement. Demonstrators are incensed by a new security law that would allow China to extradite Hong Kong residents to mainland China. Activists fear the law would not only allow Beijing to tighten its grip on Hong Kong, but would also be used to snuff out opposition. The police have cordoned off the government building, but more people crowd the street, pushing against the metal barricades. It doesn't take long before all hell breaks loose. Police fire rubber bullets at protesters. An officer dressed in head-to-toe black riot gear runs forward and lobs a canister of tear gas into the crowd. Another officer yanks back the arms of a young activist and forces him into handcuffs. An onlooker pulls out her phone and records the arrest. Then she clicks share. The footage should go live to the world on TikTok, the latest hot social media app. But despite TikTok's one billion users, no one will ever see her video. ByteDance, the company that owns the app, seems to have made sure of that. Journalists allege the company has set up monitoring of pro-democracy content coming out of Hong Kong, and they're allegedly yanking any content deemed controversial. Suspiciously few videos of Hong Kong's protest show up. ByteDance is walking a delicate line. To protect its credibility, the company has to surface some feeds from the protest, but there can't be so many that it might offend Beijing, or the Chinese government could shut down the whole operation. TikTok has become one of the most popular apps around the world, and it was created by a Chinese entrepreneur. But now, it's trapped in no man's land caught between China's anti-democracy politics and a society desperately searching for an outlet for free speech. But despite these constraints, it poses a serious challenge to its American counterpart, Instagram. From Wondery, I'm David Brown, and this is Business Wars. In our new series, we follow the battle between the social media apps TikTok and Instagram, platforms that change the way we live and interact. Where once we only photographed or recorded special occasions, now our daily existence is captured and performed from perfectly curated meals to goofy viral dances. TikTok will have to keep the Chinese government happy to survive, but a new threat is also on the horizon from Silicon Valley highly competitive technocrats who have no qualms about copying or acquiring their rivals in order to bury them. This is Episode 1, Codename. July 2010, Todos Santos in Baja California, Mexico. The turquoise sea gently laps at the white sand as Kevin Sistrom walks along the shore with his girlfriend, Nicole Schuetz. At six foot five, Sistrom towers over Schuetz. The 26-year-old software engineer may be on a beach getaway, but like many Silicon Valley techies, he's always working. He's pondering his startup, an app called Bourbon. Users check in at whatever coffee shop or bar they're visiting, and the app updates their friends. Then the user can post a photo of the location. Lately, he's barely sleeping, pouring all of his waking life into the app. And yet, Bourbon only has 100 users. The app's not taking off, and it's time to move on. But Sistrom and his co-founder, Mike Krieger, have raised half a million dollars from investors. They've hardly touched that money yet, 
which means they still have enough cash to pivot to a new idea. He turns to Schuetz. I know I'm not supposed to bring up work right now, but I have to talk this new idea through with you. Man, you really know how to rock a vacation, don't you? <sighs> Fine. Let's hear it. Mike and I have been thinking of focusing on photos. Schuetz looks up at her boyfriend, squinting into the sun. I think that's a good idea. I love the photos on Bourbon, but I don't know if I'd post any. Or why not? Well, my photos aren't that good. Oh, come on. They're great. Schuetz laughs. Thank you. But they're not as good as Greg's. The iPhone 4 camera kind of sucks. Greg is a friend of Systrom's and another user of Bourbon. But Systrom knows there's a secret to how Greg gets his pictures to look that way. And it's not his camera. Well, Greg uses a bunch of filter apps to make them look good. Schuetz pauses and cocks her head to the side. Maybe you should add filters then. It's an aha moment for Systrom. More people will share their photos if they look cool and eye-catching. And if more people start sharing photos, maybe more people will start using the app. Back at their bed and breakfast, Systrom heads straight for his laptop. In college, Systrom had used a Holga camera, which takes square film photos instead of rectangular ones. This gives Systrom a brainwave. He'll make the pictures on his app square to stand out from the competition. But how can he make the photos look better? Systrom thinks again about the Holga camera. It often created saturated images with rich colors. Sometimes there were light leaks where sunlight got onto the film. So he starts designing a filter that will mimic the same effects. By the end of the day, Systrom has his first filter. He calls it X-Pro2. It ups the contrast and saturation, making pictures look brighter and more flattering. It also adds a focus to the center of the frame by darkening the edges of the photo. Krieger, his partner, has already made a test app for posting photos. Its catchy code name is, well, code name. Sistrum and Schuetz walk to a taco stand. He snaps a photo of a dog they spot along the way. He applies the X-Pro2 filter and uploads it to code name. Systrom doesn't know it yet, but he has just taken the very first Instagram. What happens next will change the fate of his startup dreams and turn Systrom from a nobody into Silicon Valley's latest wunderkind. October 6, 2010. Systrom and Krieger are sitting in a dimly lit warehouse at an old pier in San Francisco Bay. They're at Dog Patch Labs, an industrial co-working space. It's a little after midnight and the desks are empty. Systrom and Krieger are putting the finishing touches on their new app. They've ditched bourbon altogether. Instead, they're focused solely on a photo-sharing platform. They call it Instagram, a mashup of Instant Camera and Telegram. Krieger is hunched over his laptop, tapping away. On screen is the control panel for the Apple App Store. He pushes his fingers through his dark brown hair and readjusts his glasses. His fingers hover for an instant over the keyboard. Then, he presses enter. Okay, it's live in the App Store. Systrom bends over Krieger's shoulder to peer at his screen. In the corner, a ticking counter lets them see each time the app gets a new download. Both men are too nervous to talk. Suddenly, they get a bite. There's one. A few seconds pass. There's another. They keep watching. The downloads keep coming. A few days ago, Krieger and Systrom sent out 100 download invitations to tech journalists and influential Silicon Valley people. One of their most avid users is Twitter founder Jack Dorsey. He's also invested in their app. Much of Instagram's functionality is cribbed from Twitter. You can like a photo, follow people, and use hashtags to find similarly tagged images. And you don't need anyone's permission to follow them either. It's an open network, so you can track celebrities and friends alike. 
Dorsey's been posting photos from the app to drum up interest. It seems to be paying off. As the downloads continue to climb, Krieger and Systrom are amazed. 1,000, 2,000, 5,000. It's way more than the number of people they invited. Where are all these people coming from? Krieger peers at a spreadsheet of the email addresses used to sign up. They're from Germany, Hong Kong, cities around the globe. Systrom is ecstatic. Wow, this isn't just a San Francisco thing a few of our friends are downloading. We're reaching the whole world. He and Krieger hug and decide to call it a night. On the subway train home, Systrom sees a guy using Instagram. He's amazed. Someone is actually using their app in the wild. The sun is well up by the time he walks through his front door, but then he gets a call from Krieger. Kevin, the system's down. No way. Instagram is running on one database in one computer in Los Angeles. In less than 24 hours, it's been downloaded 25,000 times. Now the system handling all the photos is overloaded. Systrom puts Krieger on speakerphone and opens up Twitter to see if anyone has noticed yet. Damn it, there are a bunch of tweets complaining we're just another startup that doesn't know how to scale. They're right, we don't. But Systrom is devastated. We built this awesome thing and completely messed it up. If people can't post because the servers are down, they're never going to come back to Instagram. Krieger sighs. We need help. Systrom hangs up and scrolls through the contacts in his iPhone. Who can he call? His thumb pauses over the name of Adam D'Angelo, a former chief technology officer from Facebook. He met D'Angelo at a party years ago and figures it's worth a shot. Systrom gets lucky. D'Angelo spends 30 minutes on the phone with him. He walks Systrom through what Instagram needs to do to get back up and running. Krieger and Systrom switch to a different service that makes it easy to buy more server space. Forgiving users return to the platform. But Instagram's problems are far from over. Fall 2011. Instagram's San Francisco office. Krieger's alarm is going off. Again. Systrom looks up at Krieger. The pair have an alarm on their phones that alerts them whenever the servers are overloaded. Lately, the alarm goes off a lot. They get to work. It's only been a year since launching, but Krieger and Systrom's app has been downloaded 10 million times. They still don't have the headcount or server power to keep up. Systrom insists he only wants to hire people who really care about Instagram, which means he and Krieger are still fixing things themselves. Servers used to go down every four or five hours. Now it happens every 15 minutes. Krieger and Systrom are exhausted. They haven't had a weekend off in months. They carry their laptops around with them wherever they go. Now, Systrom's phone is showing an unknown number with a Menlo Park area code. He picks it up. Hello? Hi, Kevin. It's Mark. No last name needed. It's Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, and one of the most powerful men in Silicon Valley. The pair met years before when Systrom was still at Stanford. But he and Zuckerberg are hardly friends. Systrom raises his eyebrows and gestures to Krieger. Krieger looks up from his laptop where he's desperately trying to get the servers back up and running. Hi, Mark. How are you? Krieger's eyes widen. Good, good. I just wanted to see how things were going with Facebook's API. Any issues? The API is the program that lets Instagram integrate with Facebook. Hardly something Zuckerberg needs to be checking up on himself. Systrom is suspicious, but he keeps talking. Oh yeah, everything's great with it. Thanks for asking. Systrom and Zuckerberg make small talk, and after a few minutes, they hang up. Krieger grills Systrom right away. Zuckerberg, what the hell did he want? I have no idea. He basically just called a chat. Systrom and Krieger have been getting a lot of calls from prestigious VC firms eager to invest in the company. 
but no one of Zuckerberg's stature has been ringing yet. Systrom is about to get a lot more casual, friendly calls from Zuckerberg. Meanwhile, another entrepreneur is planting the seeds for an app that will one day take the world by storm. Twenty twelve, Beijing, China. Zhang Yiming is sitting in his apartment near Beijing's Tsinghua University. He's twenty nine years old with buzzed black hair and half rim glasses. The smell of braised ribs and rice waft through the air as he stares at his laptop's black screen. It's filled with strings of code. The cursor blinks expectantly. Zhang's been working as an engineer at different tech companies, and he's always noticing the same thing. Customers don't know what they want. Well, what if you serve them what they want before they even know they want it? It could be a news article, a travel fair deal, a meme. Doesn't matter. The point is to keep a tight grip on their attention. So he writes a program using AI to serve up aggregated news articles from different publishers. He calls the company Totiao, which means headlines in Mandarin. The program learns what users want to read by tracking what they click on and how long they spend on each article. Then, it customizes news for the user. It's not serving up cute videos yet, but the way the program learns what users like to feed them more of that juicy content will be the foundation of TikTok. Zhang will go on to start several more companies, and each will become a building block for his blockbuster app. But right now, Zhang can't get his mind off something more immediate. Across the Pacific, he's noticed users are fixated on Instagram, an app full of images, not news. He finds that enticing. April 2012. It's a Thursday afternoon in Instagram's San Francisco office. Systrom and Krieger are huddled to one side, whispering, while their 13 employees click away at large open desks. This building used to be Twitter's headquarters, and Twitter has just made Krieger and Systrom a very exciting proposition. Systrom exhales. Five hundred million. Silicon Valley might be the only place where they'll hand out that kind of cash to dudes in their 20s. Krieger bites his lip. What do you think we should do? Before they can even ponder this, Systrom's phone rings. He recognizes the number. Hi, Mark. Zuckerberg speaks in his usual measured tone. Kevin, I've been thinking. I want to buy Instagram. Systrom has been expecting this call. He takes a deep breath and listens. I'll pay double whatever you were valued at this round. Why don't you come over? Systrom looks around. Even though he's been expecting an offer, he can't believe he's in Mark Zuckerberg's dining room. Zuckerberg's been wooing Instagram for the past six months, calling casually out of the blue to check in. And now, he says exactly what Systrom wants to hear. If you come to us, you'll get to be fully independent. We won't integrate you into Facebook. You'll get to keep running it just how you want. Systrom nods. He's not ready to give up control over Instagram unless... unless the price is right. He cuts to the chase and shoots for the moon. Okay, uh, let's talk numbers. How about two billion? Zuckerberg laughs. Come on, Kevin. I said double your current valuation, not quadruple. Let's do one billion. Krieger and Systrom's app is only 18 months old, but it also has 30 million users, a hefty number given how young the company is. On the other hand, Instagram is just a mobile app with no desktop version and no revenue. One billion dollars is a crazy amount far above the typical Silicon Valley price tag. But to Zuckerberg, Instagram's fast growth could be a lifeline for Facebook. The behemoth company has seen its own user acquisition slow. Plus, Instagram has a young audience 
that Facebook covets. And Zuckerberg has been eyeing another social media upstart that's attracting young people in droves, Snapchat. Teaming up with Instagram seems like a way to hedge against the competition. For Systrom, it feels like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Can I have some time? I need to call Mike. Of course. Zuckerberg retires to the living room to watch Game of Thrones. Meanwhile, Systrom works the phone from the dining room. He calls Krieger, then dials his lawyers and investors. A short while later, he's ready to give Zuckerberg his answer. Zuckerberg pauses the TV and looks up at Systrom. Mark, we're in. Zuckerberg stands up and they shake hands. The Facebook founder is taking no chances. He fast-tracks the process, getting the deal hammered out and signed over the weekend. Zuckerberg thinks he spurred Facebook's momentum and outwitted Snapchat. But he's unaware that over the horizon, another, more intoxicating app is incubating its own threat. December 2012, Menlo Park, California. Systrom and Krieger are in their office on Facebook's campus. It's a giant room with a large glass garage door. They've been here for three months, but they're still settling in. Systrom has two different monitors in front of him, one open to Twitter. He spots a tweet from an Instagram user, or rather a former Instagram user. It reads, I'm deleting Instagram. They now own your photos. Hashtag read the terms of service. He mutters under his breath. What are they talking about? Systrom quickly scans the photo attached to the tweet. It's a screenshot of Instagram's recently updated terms of service. And it says people's photos could be used in advertisements. The text makes it sound like Instagram and its parent company, Facebook, have the right to license people's photos royalty-free and without telling them. It's a detailed system breezed over when he approved the amended terms of service. Facebook insisted Instagram update their terms to better match those of their new parent company, but now users are protesting. Another tweet calls the new terms Instagram's suicide note. Systrom shouts for Krieger. Mike, we've got a problem. He explains the dilemma as Krieger listens with a furrowed brow. Krieger starts pulling up data on app deletions. Oh no, people are deleting it fast. Really fast. Systrom squints at the graph, which shows deletions skyrocketing. Krieger looks at him, worried. What do we do? Systrom thinks for a second. We apologize. He takes a deep breath and sits down at his laptop. He opens up a new tab to Instagram's company blog and pleads for forgiveness for the oversight. Soon after, Instagram reverts to its old terms of service. But Systrom will not quickly forget how Facebook encouraged him to make a change that infuriated his users. He and Krieger will need to pay closer attention. By now, Instagram has more than 150 million monthly users, and many of them are young people. It's one of the most popular apps in the world. But just as it's asserting its dominance, a quirkier app is gaining traction. Vine. Rather than just the still photos Instagram specializes in, Vine loops six-second videos. It's full of jackass-style goofy pranks and quick cuts of teenagers having a good time. In other words, the complete opposite of the polished, filtered aesthetics on Instagram. There's also incoming competition from Snapchat, where people send direct messages back and forth to each other. Instagram responds by adding their own 15-second videos. They follow that up by introducing direct messages. But Instagram is not the only one paying attention to the ascent of video. Spring 2014, California. 
A Chinese developer named Alex Zhu is sitting on a train. He's traveling from San Francisco to Mountain View, California. At 35, he's way older than the high school students who fill the car. <laughs> Zhu is currently working at a software company, but he's been trying his hand at his own education startup. It's not going anywhere. He's looking for something new. Zhu watches the teenagers with interest. Some of them are listening to music. Some are taking selfies. Some are on Snapchat and Vine. Then it hits him. What if he could combine the selfie and music with social media and roll it all into one? Zhu likes Vine, but he thinks its videos are too brief. At six seconds, they're just too short for advertising or sponsored content to stick. Zhu opens up his laptop. He starts writing the code for a 15-second video app, featuring clips that loop and can be set to songs. In April 2014, Musical.ly launches. It's the precursor to TikTok. And it will become one of the fastest spreading apps of all time. On the next episode, we go back to Systrom and Krieger's fateful meeting on Stanford's campus and the move that earns them both millions. At the same time, TikTok's founder launches software that gets his Chinese customers clicking. From Wondery, this is episode one of TikTok versus Instagram for Business Wars. A quick note about recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they are based on historical research. I'm your host, David Brown. Natalie Robomed wrote this story. Karen Lowe is our senior producer and editor. Edited and produced by Emily Frost. Sound designed by Kyle Randall. Kate Young is our associate producer. Our executive producers are Jenny Lauer Beckman and Marshall Louie. Created by Hernan Lopez. For Wondering.